Well, thank you so much. I need hardly say that it's been a tremendous joy for me to be here with, the, with you these days. It's been a wonderful week. And I want to thank you for the tremendous fellowship that I personally have enjoyed, as also Rick Schoon, who's been accompanying me. He's the son of the director of our work in Sweden, and he acts as my mule. He sort of carries my baggage and writes my letters. And <clears throat> no Where are you, Rick? There he is. <laughs> Stay up. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> He's bumped into a quite a lot of folks here. I'm thankful for his tremendous help. He records the messages and takes care of all kinds of other things and does his best to keep me out of mischief with no great success. <clears throat> I have a fantastic wife. Her name is Joan. And she comes from the north of Ireland. I thank God for her, for her for seven years before I met her because I was so busy, engaged, you know, traveling all around the British Isles that I didn't have time to look for a wife. So I just said, Lord, <laughs> we're created in Christ unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them, which means quite obviously that if I'm to have a wife in your divine purpose, it's already settled in heaven. You've already made the decision. There are no issues for you to face. The only thing is I don't know where she is, but you do. And that's really all I need to know. If I'm to have a wife, because if I'm not to have a wife, then it doesn't matter too much. <laughs> I mean, if you want me to go to South America and, you know, float down the Amazon, get eaten by crocodiles, I probably don't need a wife. Unless she's going to get eaten at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but the lovely thing was that um, by circumstances that I won't bother to tell you, I landed in her home. <laughs> And we saw each other about three times before we got married. <laughs> because, you see, the world was at war. <laughs> and I didn't have time. So it was a very brief courtship and very inexpensive because all my letters were paid for by the British government, being in the army. <clears throat> but uh, we spent about five months together during the first five and, a, five and a half years of our married life in the service of king and country. We've improved a little bit on that, not an awful lot, <laughs> but uh, she really has been fantastic. Totally identified in the ministry that God was pleased to entrust to us, heavily involved, and uh, we seek to get together now and again. I'll see her tomorrow for a few days, and we commute around the world and, you know, make a date sometime where we're going to meet. <laughs> and uh, we're both delighted at the incredible privilege that God has given to us to be separated so often from each other in his service. She writes to me and says, when there's no blessing, come home. <laughs> Trouble is, there's always blessing. <laughs> but it's wonderful, isn't it, to have a wife so completely identified. And uh, I rejoice in all the rich ministry that God has given to her. She's just come back from England a couple of days ago. And uh, we have four children and all our sons are boys. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes you can't tell these days, but mine are. <clears throat> my wife accepted Christ when she was seven years of age. And my oldest boy, Chris, I'm happy to say he accepted Christ when he was seven years of age. His catapult broke and he came, if you know what a catapult is. It's an engine of war, you know, uh, elastic and a piece of paper or even a stone. <laughs> Magnificent if the teacher's back is turned because <laughs> she doesn't know where it's coming from. <laughs> but uh, his broke and so in the process of mending it for him I talked to him about the Lord Jesus and that's when he received Christ. Well he's in his early 40s now. Some of you may know he married Cliff Barrow's oldest daughter, Bonnie, and uh, they have three little boys, and they live in Ravencrest Chalet, which is my home too in Colorado, Estes Park. And uh, Mark and Peter, the next two boys, they received the Lord Jesus when they were five. And Mark today, uh, he directs our international headquarters in England, Capenray. Peter has a sort of world parish. He directs the 
uh, spring school, which is our fall school in New Zealand, until Christmas time. Then he organizes evangelistic camps and then operates at our center in Australia. Then shoots back, usually through the United States and Canada, stopping at some of our centers on this part of the world before going back to lead our spring school in England. Then he takes an evangelistic team all over the British Isles before returning to New Zealand. So he has rather a wide parish. And uh, he's just come back from Israel. My fourth boy, uh, he's now 21. You'd hardly believe that two years ago I still had a teenager. <laughs> he was three years on our maintenance staff in England, but he is with us at this moment in Colorado getting more experience in construction. <laughs> so that he too can be part of the team. We're so delighted that they're all as excited as we are about the Lord Jesus. And we thank God for these boys. <clears throat> so that's, of course, been a <clears throat> source of real joy to our hearts. I was converted, as I told you last night, at the ripe old age of 12. <laughs> uh, Peter, the last boy, he was only four. All the family were away at that time, save he and myself, and much to my surprise, at the end of the evening meeting, he said, uh, we ought to pray and read the Bible. Well, that was a pretty smart suggestion and surprised me somewhat. He hadn't shown too much evidence of being particularly pious at that age. <laughs> so I took him on my knee and we read a few verses from the Bible and I explained about the Lord Jesus coming to live within you sharing his life every moment of every day, but he couldn't do it until first, having died, that our sins might be forgiven, we invite him to come to be our savior. <clears throat> well, he listened very, very carefully. I said, do, do you know the Lord Jesus lives inside you? Or oh, no. Wouldn't you like to? Well, he said, yes. So we prayed together. And uh, I deliberately didn't say anything to his mother. They always had a little devotion, of course, at night, and I thought if this is truly of God's Holy Spirit, life will be manifest. And sure enough, that evening, he blurted it out. He said, Jesus lives in my tummy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the inside for a small boy. I'm happy to tell you that his theology has risen by about 15 inches. <clears throat> and now he knows where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. <clears throat> So that's been a great joy for us. <clears throat> Torchbearers, well, God laid this upon our hearts when I returned from World War II <clears throat> and a beautiful place up in the northwest of England, uh, 170 acres of lovely parkland near the English Lake District, about 70 miles south of the Scottish border, 150 miles, say, from Glasgow, 60, 160 from Edinburgh. Beautiful location. And uh, we've had about 125,000 young folks staying with us there, but it's sort of budded out into different parts of the world so that we have two in Austria, two in Switzerland, one in Spain, Switzerland, France, and uh, in uh, Austria. And uh, here in the United States, in Colorado, there in Estes Park, in Texas, between San Antonio and Kerrville, <clears throat> and uh, a beautiful location on Thetis Island in the Straits of Georgia between Vancouver and Victoria on the southern tip of Vancouver Island. And uh, in Australia, and we have a school, as I indicated, in New Zealand, and now a new one that we've just established in Indonesia between Jakarta and Bandung up in the mountains. <clears throat> we have mini schools in places like Malaysia, Burma, and Hong Kong. And we thank God for these delightful opportunities. There's a jungle base 150 miles from Bangalore in India, elephants and all. And... Uh, that's a marvelous opportunity to reach out to the countless millions of that needy country. 700 million, as all of you know, I'm sure, and 70% living them in little villages, so many of which there in particular where we are in the jungle, utterly pagan, but they reach out to those needy people for whom the Lord Jesus died. And uh, we have a, an administrative headquarters and a Bible school outreach in Manila in the Philippines. And... Uh, we're just about to establish a new base in Japan. And the object, of course, is Bible camp ministry so that thousands of kids can come and be confronted with the total claims of the Lord Jesus. Having come to Christ as a boy in a boy's camp, needless to say, that's very much laid on my heart. And so we've ministered to these young folks all over the world. And then as a an offspring, as it were, of the Bible camp ministry, the short-term non-vocational Bible schools, 
And every winter we have about 800 students in residence from about 30 different countries in these different locations. And then a couple of hundred added to that during the spring and summertime in special uh, shorter term Bible schools so that about a thousand students, 18 years in age and upwards, come and participate in that Bible school program. Not a vocational training, we're simply teaching Christians what it means to be a Christian. You see, if you produce preachers, you don't necessarily produce Christians. But if you produce Christians, you always produce preachers. So that's more economical. So we do it that way around. <laughs> And uh, we thank God for the thousands of young folk that come, and some of them have been here this week, and some are in residence now, of course, during our spring school. You may say, how do you start these centers? Well, it's very simple. All you have to do, some 30 years ago, is drive down an autobahn in the south of Germany <coughs> with a somewhat loaded car and a lot of baggage. I had my wife with me. And if you <coughs> have your wife with you, you always have a lot of baggage. <coughs> and then you see a boy hitchhiking. And <laughs> you're strongly uh, sort of desirous of picking him up, but you look at the car and you feel the springs and you know how many people are aboard and you harden your heart and drive on. But about 300 yards later, you're strongly impelled to go back and pick him up. Because, you see, that boy, who lived near Hamburg, had a deep desire in his heart to know Jesus Christ, but didn't know how. What do you think God does when he sees a boy on the side of the road, who wants to become a Christian, but nobody's told him exactly how to become a Christian? It's very simple. God watches all the cars going by until he sees one with a Christian in. And then he says, stop, pick him up. And the, if the driver's too stupid too idle, too much of a hurry, or thinks the car's too laden that he drives on, then 300 yards later he shouts a little louder. <laughs> I'm glad I heard the second shout. Went back, picked him up, took him to the place where dear friends were allowing us to spend the night in their home, and they graciously gave him accommodation. And that night, <clears throat> Peter accepted Christ. He was raised from the dead. He became a partaker of the divine nature. The Lord Jesus came to invade his humanity. Exactly what it means to be a Christian. A living finger on the hand of God. Marvelous. Well, <clears throat> he came to our home, point of fact, and was with us five years and we gave him a wife. <clears throat> I mean, you can't do much more than lead a boy to Christ, give him his training, introduce him to his wife, and then give him a job. I mean, apart from burying him, <laughs> That's about all you can do. <clears throat> but you know, before that, as a teenager boy, he went up to uh, his home and led one of his school chums to Christ. Well, that boy went to Bible school, met a sweet Spanish girl, and as a result of that, he now directs our center in Spain, on the Mediterranean coast near Valencia. Then Peter came, first to Cape and Rea, and then Having been deeply impressed with the need of the young folks in Austria, he went on assignment on our staff to a place called Schladming. And we seconded him to a Lutheran church where God first marvelously used him amongst the young folks. Now we have a beautiful old castle built a thousand years ago, which we've dusted and rehabilitated, and thousands of kids have been there. But in the meantime, while he was in Schladming, there was a knock on the door, and a boy came with a letter from his mum and dad, who were Lutheran Christians. And they said, we understand in this letter that you're a German young man come to Austria to lead boys and girls to Christ. Well, we have four sons, and none of them are converted. So we're sending our oldest boy, Ernst, with this letter, please lead him to Christ. Well, that was a nice invitation. So right there on the doorstep, he led him to Christ. Now, <clears throat> Ernst, in the meantime, went back later and led his three younger brothers to Christ. And his mother to Christ. He's just come back after five years in Micronesia, the islands off the mainland of Indonesia. But having led his three brothers to Christ, the older of those three boys, when he was still a teenager, came to one of our summer conferences <clears throat> and then hitchhiked back through England, France, Germany, to Austria. Now, in the meantime, of course, Peter had become the director of that big castle there in Upper Austria, Schloss Klaus. So now we've got two centers, just because a kid was standing on the side of the road, you see. Now, in the meantime, 
while that boy, his, the older of his three younger brothers, was hitchhiking back through England, France, Germany, and Austria, he stayed overnight in a youth hostel in Paris. And while he was in that youth hostel, he met a Buddhist student from Japan. And being, you see, a living member of the body of Jesus Christ, his lips gave utterance to what the Lord Jesus had to say to that Buddhist student. <laughs> Learned that he wanted to go to England. He was sort of hitchhiking around the world. And so that young Austrian boy said, if you go to England, call it Cape and Ray, which was pretty smart. Because he, he knew what would hit him once he got there. And it did. <laughs> we were building a new conference hall and he worked and got so interested, asked whether he could stay another three months and did. During which time he accepted the Lord Jesus. He came through our Bible school. I had the joy of baptizing him in the lake at Cape and Ray in England. He went to Bible Training Institute in Glasgow and he now is our national director in Japan and has just purchased some land so that we can establish a new center in that country. You see, it's so simple. All you have to do is pick up a kid about 33 years ago on an outer barn in Germany. You see, lead him to Christ. He leads somebody to Christ who establishes the center in Spain. He leads his three younger brothers to Christ, one of whom hitchhikes through England, Germany, Paris, leads a Buddhist Japanese boy to come to England to find Christ so we can have another center in Japan. Isn't it simple? I mean, could you organize that? I mean, could you sit down in committee and see, you know, plan it all out? Well, of course you couldn't. You see, the Lord Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And the beautiful thing about a river is it flows. You can't push it. Nor can you channelize it. If you do, if you want it to flow in a certain direction, you've got to dig the channel. Then it isn't a river. It's a canal. That's man-made. And it's always changing course. It's always unique. You can never keep it the same shape. If you want to keep a river the same shape, you've got to freeze it. But then you haven't got a river. You've only got a block of ice. The best thing to do is let it flow and cut its own channel. And over all these years, since 1947, God has been cutting the channel. And all over the world, circling the globe today, we have 17 centers with thousands of kids, boys, girls, men and women, so that they might be introduced to that living, dynamic relationship to the Lord Jesus that allows him to be God in the man. Well... That's just a little panoramic view of what we call torch-bearing. Nothing, nothing novel about it. Nothing unique. There are countless other agencies that God has been pleased to bring into being. And we enjoy the sweetest fellowship with such. And it's our privilege being interdenominational, interorganizational, and international. Simply to be a fellowship that serves, as best God would have us know, the interests of every true believer worldwide. And that's our privilege. To serve others. What we've been talking about the Christian life in these days, especially as it was evidenced in that early group of believers, men, remember, who were incorrigibly happy, utterly unafraid, and nearly always in trouble, who knew what they believed, believed what they knew, acted on the assumption that it was true, and let God prove it, who were sent and went. But they went always that way, and we have been discussing that for the last couple of nights. Something had to happen to get them out of Matthew 16 into Acts chapter 5. Matthew 16, forbidden by the Lord Jesus to tell anybody that he, Jesus, was the Christ. Yet Acts chapter 5, though beaten and flogged, forbidden to say anything in his name. Rejoicing that they were allowed to suffer shame for Jesus, they ceased not to teach and preach that Jesus was the Christ. What was it that made the difference? The resurrection. The resurrection. After a death, at first they did not want. A resurrection in which at first they had not believed. But in rediscovering the Lord Jesus, as he appeared to them in the upper room, they got a new joy, new Bible, new message, new responsibility, and a new enabling. Now, said the Lord Jesus, I'm going to lift the prohibition and you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. But before you embark upon those new responsibilities, tarry in the city of Jerusalem because I haven't yet 
return to be with my Father so that I can come in the, in the person of my other self, the Holy Spirit, and occupy your humanity as that new body the Father is going to give me so that your hands will be mine to work with, your feet mine to walk with, your lips mine to speak with, eyes to see with, ears to hear with, hearts to love with. Remember? That's the Christian life. Well, how did it work out? Well, I thought we might glance at that just for a few minutes tonight. Turn to Acts chapter 8. The church in action. The church which is his body. Chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was consenting to the death of Stephen. Stood by bear, saw his blood run in the gutter, heard his bones snap as he was stoned to death. And Saul, as for him, verse 3, he made havoc of the church. Entering into every house and hailing men and women, he committed them to jail. Which, of course, was the very best thing that could possibly have happened for the early church. Because at that stage, they were tempted to settle down and get comfy. But that wasn't the purpose which they had been redeemed. Because God didn't send his son simply to come into this world that men might get out of hell and into heaven. But that he, our risen Lord Jesus, might get out of heaven into them. That they indeed might be that humanity in which he would continue to do that which he had begun to do. And teach that which he had begun to teach as he came to seek and to save that which is lost. And it was never his intention that the church should get comfortable in Jerusalem. So he put a cat among the pigeons. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. What's the difference between preaching the word and preaching Christ? Well, no difference. We saw that last evening. There's no dichotomy between the written word and the living word or between the living word and the written word. That was the mistake the theologians made. They detached the written word from the living word. And that, remember from last night, was the mistake that the disciples made. They detached the living word from the written word. And for that reason, to the theologians, the Bible didn't make sense. And to the disciples, Jesus didn't make sense. But now, you see, the Lord Jesus, having opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures, whether they preached the word or they preached Christ. It was one and the same thing. They knew they couldn't preach the word without preaching Christ, and they knew they couldn't preach Christ without preaching the word. And Philip in Samaria was marvelously owned of God as he bore testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus as one who laid down his life that we might be reconciled to God and know the power of his divine indwelling. And there was great joy, verse 8, in that city. And then when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, verse 25, they returned to Jerusalem and they preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. In other words, after that great city-wide crusade in Samaria, they had subsidiary campaigns in the villages around, and by this time, of course, Philip's name made news. And everybody was out to hear the great preacher, city-wide evangelist. And then verse 26, the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go. Go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. To the citywide evangelist whose name made news, the Spirit of God came to give instructions from the head to a member of his body. Go. I want you to get on a donkey and go for a ride in the desert. And of course many of us at that stage would have been tempted to argue. What do you think I'm going to do in the desert? I'm the citywide evangelist. I mean, nobody knows me in the, in the desert, but around here, everybody knows me. They all come up to hear me preach. What am I going to do in the desert? Who do you... A bunch of goats? 
But you see, Philip didn't argue. Why didn't he argue? Very simple. He was a man being filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, you say, how do you know he was filled with the Spirit? Well, the answer to that is equally simple. It tells you in the next verse. When God said go, he arose and went. In other words, he was sent and went. What happens when you're sent and went? You're put. And if you know who sent you, you know who put you, and if it's God who sent you, and God who put you, nothing can frighten you. And you don't even bother to ask questions. Because you realize now there are no decisions for you to make. As a living, healthy, robust, full-blooded member of the body of Christ, there are only instructions to obey. So he went. A donkey ride in the desert. And as he arose and went, behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading of all things, in the middle of the desert, the prophecy of Isaiah. And the Spirit then said to Philip, go near, join yourself to that chariot. And Philip ran. He had to run, otherwise he'd have missed his text. But he arrived dead on text. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think in the middle of the desert, an Ethiopian eunuch was reading Chancellor Vicks Trekker, a man of great authority under Queen Candace. What do you think he was reading? It says, verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter like a lamb dumb before his shearers who opened in on his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? His life is taken from the earth. The gospel according to Isaiah. The man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The cost of our peace laid upon him. By whose stripes we're healed. Said Philip to the eunuch, verse 30, Understandest thou what thou readest? He said, How can I, except some man should guide me? I need a voice. I need somebody to tell me. Said the eunuch to Philip, verse 34, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this. Is he talking about himself or is he talking about some other man? Say, what a fantastic opportunity, Philip, there in the middle of the desert. All that God said to him was get on a donkey and go for a ride in the desert. No other instructions. God didn't tell him why. And Philip didn't even have to know. He only had to go when God sent him with a hilarious expectation of something that would happen that would be to God's total satisfaction. That's how we know that he was a man being filled with the Holy Spirit. Of our Lord Jesus, we're told, Luke chapter 4 and verse 1, Jesus being full of the Holy Spirit was led by the Spirit into the desert. The evidence that our Lord Jesus, every moment of every day from the moment of conception, was being filled with the Holy Ghost, was that he was told by his Father what to do, and did at all times what he was told. I do only those things that please him. So Philip, verse 35, and we were discussing this over lunch, one or two of us. This is one of the most magnificent lectures on homiletics you could find anywhere. Said the eunuch to Philip, of whom speaketh the man this? So Philip, 
verse 35, opened his mouth. And that's the best thing to do if you're going to say something. <laughs> and you think it's very elementary, but a lot of true Christians need to learn how to open their mouths. But remember this, only open your mouth if you've got something to say. <laughs> when the disciples, before they wanted the cross or dared to believe in the resurrection, with all their enthusiasm wanted to serve Christ, he said, keep your mouth shut. Because they didn't know what it was all about. But now you see Philip with the others have rediscovered the Lord Jesus in the fullness and power of his resurrection as the one whom they crucified but God raised from the dead. Began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. If he had come from one of our liberal theological seminaries today he'd have probably apologized for the prophecy of Isaiah and he'd probably said well you know there are at least seven different theories about its authorship and we're not absolutely certain that it's authentic <laughs> fat lot of use of he he would have been in the desert but then you see he never would have received the instructions to go beginning at the self same scripture he preached unto him Jesus because these are they that testify, said the Lord Jesus, of me. He was wonderfully saved, almost took Philip's breath away. As they were on their way, they came to a certain water, and no doubt Philip had explained that the beautiful picture then, as now, of our identity with the Lord Jesus as those judicially executed in the person of another, is to go beneath the water, testifying to the world, I want you to know that the person I was and you have known me to be in all my sin and need has been buried with Christ and I give you public notice that you can say goodbye to the person you knew me to be and when you come out from the water no doubt Philip would explain to the eunuch in this beautiful picture of what happens when a person on the grounds of redemption enjoys that spiritual regeneration that puts God back into the man when you come out of the water you're testifying to the world that you being identified with Christ in death he now the risen Lord has come to share his life with you and you share his resurrection and you give public notice to the world mom dad brothers sisters school chums fellow students workmates fellow drivers my associates in the office my customers and clients I give you public notice that the person I used to be you can consider buried and now you have the absolute right in that I have shared the resurrection of my Lord Jesus to expect of my hands what he would do to expect from my lips to hear what he would say and to expect with my legs to see him going where he wants that's baptism that's baptism I am crucified with Christ nevertheless, uh, nevertheless I live yet not I Christ lives in me so I give you public right to see Christ behave. That's a Christian. Because remember, a Christian is somebody who cannot possibly happen apart from Jesus Christ. Well, while he was explaining this, they came across some water and said the, the eunuch to, the, to Philip, he said, oh, what hinders me to be baptized? Well, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, of course you may. Well, he answered and said, of course I believe. I believe that this Jesus you've been telling about is the Christ, the Son of God. I was just waiting for somebody to come and tell me what that meant. Fantastic. So how hard was it for Philip to lead that man to Christ? Well, he couldn't help it. I mean, did he need an all-night prayer meeting to twist God's arm to bestow some blessing upon that? Well, of course not. I mean, if he, in the middle of the desert, asked God to bless that man, God would say, what do you think I put you there for? That's why I told you to get on the donkey and go for a ride. <laughs> because I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. This man went all the way to Jerusalem to find God and found nothing but sterile, dead religion. But God doesn't leave a man in the lurch. He tells a healthy member of his body to get on a donkey and go for a ride in the desert. So simple. When they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. He came by donkey, went back by air, and the eunuch saw him no more. He went on his way rejoicing. That was the church in action. 
Say, who organized it? Who put Philip at that precise, precise moment in time? In the place where he would encounter a man reading his Bible all about a savior who was wounded for his transgressions and with a heart hungry to know who it could be and how he could know God. Who organized that? Well, the Lord Jesus. You see, he's the head of the body. And all he's asking of you and me, men and women, boys and girls, who know that we have been redeemed in his precious blood and that he's come by his Holy Spirit to indwell our humanity, all he wants of us is our sensitivity to his direction so that we are told what to do and do as we're told. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. In the meantime, we're told, chapter 9 and verse 1, Saul, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, <coughs> went to the high priest, desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. That's Saul of Tarsus, arch enemy of the early church, dangerous man. But on the way to Damascus, there was a light brighter than the sun at noonday, and we discussed this on Wednesday night. And he was flung sightless to the ground. Heard a voice in the Hebrew tongue saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Hard for you to kick against the pricks. Saul of Tarsus capitulated. Said he, Lord, verse 6, chapter 9, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord Jesus said, Arise and go. Go into the city and it shall be told you what thou must do. And he went. Ended up in the house of a man called Judas in a street called Straight. And verse 10 tells us that there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. He said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and give you one, one guess. What do you think he said? Go. Go. Go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Behold, he prayed. He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him. Then he might receive his sight. Go! You see, to Philip, God said, get on the donkey and go for a ride in the desert. To Ananias, one of his disciples, another healthy member of the body of Christ on earth, said he, I want you to knock on a door down the road. A little house-to-house -house visitation. Well, Ananias wasn't, at first, all that enthusiastic. He said... Uh, did you say Saul of Tarsus? God said, yes, Saul of Tarsus. And I imagine Ananias said, are you sure you got the name right? <laughs> God said, yes, I got the name right. <laughs> well, are you sure I'm the best person to go? <laughs> I mean, would you have been all that enthusiastic to knock on the door where you knew Saul of Tarsus, arch enemy of the early church with letters of authority to throw into jail everybody who dared to name the name of Jesus? Would you have been all that enthusiastic? Ananias answered, verse 13, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil you have done, he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on your, on your name. And you want, you want me to knock on that man's door? Right. Get on. The Lord said, go thy way, he's a chosen vessel unto me. The last person, Ananias, maybe you would ever have supposed would become a Christian. But he's a chosen vessel unto me. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. I haven't offered him health, wealth, prosperity, or anything else. I've just recognized the deep longing of his heart in his fanatical pursuit of religion, 
doing it with the utmost sincerity, thinking misguidedly that he was serving God. I hated what he was doing, but I loved his motive. And knew that if only he could come face to face with truth, he'd obey it and did. So go. I said, go. And Ananias stopped arguing. Do you know why? He was a man being filled with the Holy Spirit. How do we know that? Well, it tells in the next verse, 17. Ananias went. That's what it means to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be a healthy member of the body of Christ. Exactly what you expect of your hands when you tell them to do something. <laughs> you expect them to do it. If you want to eat your food, you tell your hands to pick up the knife and fork, and they do. Well, what do you expect? What would you anticipate the Lord Jesus would expect of us when we dare to say, I'm a Christian, a member of his body, subject to his headship, sharing his life, he dwelling within me. That humanity the Father has presented to him on earth today so that he can continue through me to do his ancient work, seeking and saving that which is lost. What do you expect? that he would anticipate if I dare to say I'm a Christian. Well, when he tells me to go, I go. The only evidence that I'm a healthy, living, robust, full-blooded member of his body, enjoying the sheer adventure of sharing his life on earth on the way to heaven. Ananias went his way, entered into the house, and all he had to do when he went into the house where there was housed the man who so shortly before had been the arch enemy of the early church was to put his arms around his neck and say, Brother Saul. The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Say, so how difficult was it for Ananias to to bring blessing to this man who had been the arch persecutor of the early church. We couldn't help it. All he had to do was to be told what to do, do he was told and fling his arm around his neck. Haven't we made the Christian life complicated? Are you a Christian? Then of whose body are you, are you a member? Under whose jurisdiction do you operate? Who do you recognize as being the head of that body that you say you belong to? Are you allowing other people to play God in your life other than Jesus Christ? Then probably the Christian life for you will be very exhausting. Because in all probability with the best will in the world you'll be trying to live a life for him that only he can live through you. Only a glance at the tenth chapter because the story is well known to you it was the devout man he was a <coughs> a Roman officer very very fine man he was a major <laughs> centurion of one of the most famous regiments in the imperial Roman army it's believed that this regiment was that regiment that finally was stationed in Chester in England and there's a museum with their chattels and things they left behind Cornelius he was a good man he wasn't a Christian <clears throat> but he was devout, he prayed to God always, extremely generous and gave much alms to the people, probably the one who built the synagogue for the Jews, although he was an officer in an enemy occupying army. Everybody loved him. And the Jews had the highest regard. And then God sent an angel. About the ninth hour of the day, he was somewhat surprised and the angel brought the message thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God now send men to Joppa call for one Simon whose surname is Peter he lodgeth with one Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside he'll tell you what you ought to do God sent this servant of his and said your prayers and your arms haven't been despised God never despises the goodness of a good man but God was kind enough, recognizing the symptoms of a soul quest, of a man hungry for God, praying day and night, fasting, doing good things, because he wanted to know God. 
God doesn't despise a man for that. But in answer to his prayer, he gives him a warning. This time to be on the lips of Peter to tell him what he ought to do. And you see, because Cornelius was such a good man, he got saved. Good men like Cornelius always got, get saved. Not because they're good. But because they're good enough to know that they're not good enough. You see, it's only men as good as Cornelius that are good enough to know that they're not good enough. And he wasn't even ashamed to tell his servants and the soldier that he sent as an escort. That he was sending for a man who would let them know how they could be saved. In the meantime, remember, God was warning Peter. Up on the roof, having a quiet doze while somebody was getting the food ready, he saw the vision. A sheet lowered by its four corners with unclean beasts and God said, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. And he protested. That's dirty stuff. I'm a Jew. I can't eat that stuff. You know I can't eat that stuff. God said, Call not thou common that which I have cleansed. Three times it happened. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek you. Arise therefore, verse 20, and get thee down. And what's the word? Go. Go with them. Doubting nothing. I sent them. So you see, to Philip, God said, get on a donkey and go for a ride in the desert. To Ananias, God said, go and knock on a door down the road. To Peter, he said, I want you to spend a day in a doghouse. A house of a dirty Gentile dog. These men have come to fetch you. I sent them. And Peter stopped arguing. Do you know why he stopped arguing? Because he was a man being filled with the Holy Spirit. How do you know? Well, it tells you the next verse. 21. Peter went. God said, go, and Peter went. To Philip, God said, go, and he went. To Ananias, God said, go, and he went. To Peter, he said, go, and he went. And when you're sent and went, you're always put. And you're always put in the place where God wants you to be. And blessing's inevitable. I wouldn't waste God's time asking me to bless him in the place, in the place where he put me. If I'm absolutely convinced at any given moment that I'm in a place where he put me, what possible service could be rendered by my saying, God, please bless me? God would simply say, what do you think I put you there for? Don't you credit me with any intelligence? You're a member of my body. I'm the head of that body. And if you go when I send you, you're put in the place where I want you. Credit me, please, with enough intelligence to know that I'm going to do something that will be to my eternal satisfaction, even if it isn't to anybody else's. That's the hilarious expectation that you have the right to have, so long as you're prepared to be sent and be numbered amongst those who win. Nothing sensational about it. There's nothing much sensational about going for a ride and on the back of a donkey in the desert. Nothing very much sensational about knocking on the door down the road. Or going with uh, a couple of servants and a soldier escort back to the house of a Roman officer. Nothing very sensational or spectacular, but essentially miraculous. When Cornelius finally welcomed Peter, he said, thank you for coming. We are here all gathered, and he had filled the place with his friends. Not to hear your opinions, but to hear what God has to say through your lips. What a marvelous congregation. And before ever Peter had done preaching, God had seen the faith in their hearts that embraced the message. Acts 15. God knowing their hearts cleansed them through their faith and witnessed giving them the Holy Spirit. And Cornelius and his friends, in receiving the Holy Spirit from God, in response to their faith, as they learned that Jesus, God's dear Son, died in their place, were raised from the dead. 
And Peter was still preaching. <laughs> Hadn't got to his third point. Not even the little poem at the end. There wasn't even an invitation. I mean, it was hardly respectable. And yet they were all saved. <laughs> so how difficult was it for the Philip to lead the eunuch to Christ? Couldn't help it. How difficult was it for Ananias to be a blessing to Saul of Tarsus who had encountered Christ on the road to Damascus? Well, couldn't help it. All he had to do was fling his arms around his neck. How difficult was it for Peter to lead Cornelius, the dirty Gentile dog and his friends, to Christ? He didn't even know they were saved, though he was still preaching. God had done the job. Say... What did it take for Philip in the desert to be the right man in the right place at the right time saying the right thing to the right person? Well, he had to die to his reputation as a citywide evangelist, be told what to do and do as he told. Say, so what did it take for Ananias to be the right man in the right place at the right time saying the right thing to the right person? Very simply, he had to die to his own physical well-being. He was sticking his neck on the block knocking on the door of the arch enemy of the early church, but he died to all that. So what did it take for Peter to be the right man, the right place at the right time, saying the right thing to the right person? Well, he just had to die to his racial and religious prejudices, his denominational prejudices. Be told what to do and do as he was told. Isn't that simple? That was the church in action. Say, who was running the church? Well, the Lord Jesus. The head of the body. Operating through his Holy Spirit, who's the nervous system of that body. So that just as the Father could communicate to the Son through the indwelling Holy Spirit, through whom he shared as man on earth the life of his Father God in heaven, so now the Lord Jesus by the same Holy Spirit, communicates to you and to me, who on earth has redeemed sinners, cleansed in his blood, share his resurrection life. What a fantastic privilege that God has given to us. And you see, nothing's changed. It's as true today as it was then, because the Lord Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The only essential difference between what he began to do and began to teach, remember, on earth in that body the Father gave him at Bethlehem, and what he continue to do and continue to teach as recorded for us in the book of the Acts was that it was in the new body the Father gave him on the day of Pentecost when he, risen from the dead, came to invade the humanity of 120 forgiven sinners to whom were added that evening 3,000 others and then daily, all down the centuries till 1986 added to the Lord members of his body makes life incredibly exciting you know, uh, I had to fly once from Billings, Montana to Seattle. It was a plane that was stopping at uh, Spokane in Washington. It was a full plane, just a few seats vacant. One was next to me. And then a mum and dad came with a whole bunch of kids. They had to scatter to occupy the remaining seats. And one of the children, a boy of about 12, came and sat alongside. And after a bit, we got into conversation. He was a nice kid. And I talked to him about the Lord Jesus. I was interested to know that he was 12 because I was converted when I was 12. So I shared with him how in a boy's camp I received the Lord Jesus. We had heaps of fun. I took his name and address because that's very important. Because if God gives you a lovely opportunity like that, keep in touch. He became part of my parish. <laughs> so I wrote to him. Didn't get a letter written. In reply, don't expect a letter all that soon. No, not from a kid of 12. <laughs> because they hate writing letters worse than I do. But finally, I did get a letter. It's always a source of joy to me. This is what he wrote. He said, Dear Mr. Thomas, when I was about 10 years old, well, he was 12, not 10. I told him that afterwards because he, I had it in my <laughs> address book. He didn't even know how old he was. When I was about 10 years old, I sat next to you on an airplane from Billings, Montana to Spokane, Washington. And I don't like this bit. He said, I remember you as a happy old man. 
Do you know when he wrote this? 1966. 20 years ago. And he thought I was a happy old man. Happy old man, my foot. Anyway, he said, I remember you as a happy old man, full of life. And I remember that you asked me all kinds of questions about Jesus. And you shared with me some things about him. But now I can't remember what. <laughs> That's encouraging too, isn't it, for a preacher? <laughs> but the things I do remember most was that you, though a perfect stranger, talked to me, made me laugh, told me for the first time about one called Jesus. And when we changed planes in Spokane, I felt you were my friend. And you even wrote me one letter that I now have before me. That was in November 1966. Today, he said, I'm 19 years old. He said, I'm now about to graduate from a Lutheran Bible school here in Seattle. Most of all, I wanted to share with you the joy that the Lord has given to me in his son, Jesus. In the fellowship of the saints, in the deepness of the word, I praise him for leading me, making himself real to me, loving me, dying for me, changing me from my old nature to the new glorified nature in him. I want to live for him. I want to live to his praise. I want to live to his glory. He quotes Ephesians 1.12, that I may be to the praise of his glory. Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I. Please don't get me wrong. Christ lives in me. This, he said, is my single heart's desire. I want you to know this because you were the first one. I remember talking to me about Jesus in a real way. You shared through your witness and your prayers in my salvation and in my fulfillment in Christ. I just wanted you to know that and to know that I'm eternally thankful that you love Jesus enough to share him with me. Thank you, said he in Christ. I'll see you in heaven. Be looking for me. Well, I wasn't prepared to wait till I got to heaven. I mean, he didn't think it would be all that long before I got there, so... <laughs> <laughs> he signed himself a fellow child of the king, Brad Agerbrook. Next time I flew into Seattle, I contacted him. We had a marvelous time of fellowship in the airport. And then just a very short time ago, because he teaches now in Oregon, he came to the coast where I was having a conference, drove two hours just to have 20 minutes to remember what a joy it is, you see, to be available to the Lord Jesus. Just a kid. In a plane. Well, I didn't have to get on a donkey. I just had to get on a plane, that's all. But get excited about being a Christian. It isn't, it isn't just sort of you know, getting involved in Christian work. No, no, no. Just be a Christian. Just be a Christian. Just be a healthy, living, hilariously happy member of the body of the Lord Jesus in joyful anticipation that under the prompting of his Holy Spirit, he's going to cause your path to cross with some of a boy, girl, man or woman who's desperately in need of the one whom you already know. And he knows where they are. Exactly where they are. You don't even have to know what he's doing when he does it. One of the greatest joys of my life now, almost every week of my life, almost every day of every week, is to meet those who are surfacing and who come to me again, as many have done here in these few days and said it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 15 years ago. And I just want to thank you. Now, I don't know these dear folks. Don't remember their faces. Don't remember the circumstance. But something happened that has its lasting consequence to the inestimable enrichment of their lives simply because you're available and you see there's not one boy not one girl man or woman sitting here in this congregation this evening who cannot be that available to the Lord Jesus that whether you know it or whether you don't which is totally irrelevant his life released through you like a flowing river will make its impact and change the course of some boy's life girl man or woman to the uttermost ends of the earth just five years ago, I had the great privilege of speaking at commencement Columbia Bible College, South Carolina. I was speaking at meetings in Germany at the time, so I had to fly back for those two days and then fly back to Germany on the Sunday <coughs> to be back in time for the meetings on Monday. But there was a student there who was taking a graduate course, so instead of leaving after graduation, he remained, passed a message. He said, I'd like to talk to you. So on the Sunday morning, he came. 
He was a little diffident, introduced himself, Jack Cooper. He said, uh, I don't know quite how to talk to you because uh, I don't know whether you'll fully understand. But he said, you're the only real father that I've ever had. Now, I'd never seen him before. He said, uh, I'm an Apache Indian. And I was brought up in an Apache Indian village in New Mexico. He said, my grandfather and my great-grandfather were two of the most famous Apache Indian chiefs. They were fine, noble men. Involved, of course, at that time in the Indian Wars. But he said, my mother and my father have been debauched, degenerate drunkards. I've never known real parents. My father's a brutal man. From my earliest days as a little child, he thrashed me mercilessly. At the age of eight, he beat me. So brutally that I lay on the ground in despair and in agony. And I cried from my heart, God, where are you? He said, I didn't know God. I didn't even know there was a God. But I felt somehow there must be somebody somewhere who cared. That was the beginning of the awakening of his soul. He said, by the 18, I was as drunken as my dad. I was not only a drug addict, I was a drug pusher. And I was a gun runner. He said, there was seldom a day that I slept before I bought two or three thousand dollars in my pocket in the pursuit of my dirty trades. But by the age of 23... My whole life seemed to have disintegrated. And in sheer despair, I dropped on my knees again. And I said, God, whoever you are, save me. He said, I didn't know what it meant to be saved. I'd never heard the language. But within a day or two, in the first First time ever in our Apache Indian village, a lady missionary came through and she led me to Christ. But she only stayed a day or two. But before she went, she left me your tapes and your books. And for several years, you were the only church I ever went to. The only voice I ever heard. The only counselor to whom I could go. The only real father I ever had. No, I didn't know that. He said, I want you to know that. It was at your recommendation to that lady that she recommended me to come here to Columbia Bible College. I've graduated. I'm taking a postgraduate course so that I can go back to that Indian village in that neighborhood and start a Bible school, said he, so that no little boy of eight years of age in agony would ever have to cry out to God and have to wait so long before he discovered who he is. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, you're surrounded by boys and girls and men and women whose heart cry out for God and they don't even know what they need but you do because he lives within your heart and all he's waiting for you is to be in that sensitivity as healthy members of his body so that he who knows the crying need of a lost world who satisfies the hungry soul with goodness can send you where he wants you to clothe his divine activity so that that little boy, girl, man or woman may not go on seeking in vain. Why not get excited? Get up tomorrow morning and say, Lord Jesus, 
Thank you for the incredible privilege that you've given to me as my Redeemer, having reconciled me to God and cleansed me from my sins, that you should come and live within me, that I might be available to you to reach out to the uttermost ends of the earth, that some boy, girl, man or woman may be raised from the dead and with me added to the Lord to share your life on earth until at last we see you face to face and then forever. Then you can say, I'm a Christian. Not a super Christian. Just a Christian. That's all. Now let's pray. I don't know your heart. Maybe some boy, girl, man, or woman. And there's been a deep cry in your own heart for longer, maybe, than you would care to tell. To know God for yourself. Maybe some boy, some girl who's come in with that group here just for tonight and be on campus tomorrow. I don't know, you're a stranger to me. But I'll tell you something. You're not a stranger to him who came to seek and save that which is lost. And what a wonderful thing it is to be lost. You see, if you're lost, it means you're wanted. You don't throw lost things in the trash can. You look in the trash can for lost things. That's why the Lord Jesus was always getting into trouble for keeping bad company. He could meet the woman in Samaria. He could stop beneath the tree where Zacchaeus was hiding. He knows your heart. And if you're lost, you're wanted. And he who wants you is here. Wanted you so much that he died upon the cross. That in the shedding of his own precious blood you could be reconciled to a holy God and stop existing and come alive. To be inhabited by your maker so that on earth you added to his new body could be the means whereby he might meet the desperate need of one of your own fellow human beings and hear the needy cry of some soul in despair. What a marvelous thing. For those of us who know him, our Lord Jesus, to be our Redeemer, to tell him tonight, Lord Jesus, I don't know where to go, I don't know where to look, but you do. I just want to become that sensitive to you that when you say go, I'll yield obedience to your command and find myself miraculously the right man in the right place at the right time saying the right thing to the right person. So I dare to thank you already in advance for the blessing you're going to be through me. Somebody's waiting for me. Almost round every corner loving Savior there's somebody that you want to reach and I'm available to the outermost ends of the earth. Thank you for the privilege of being expendable. That as the Father once sent you, so you now may send me. Thanks, dear Lord, in your own precious name. Amen. You've been listening to a sermon by Major Ian Thomas. If you've been blessed by this sermon, you can find more sermons by him and additional resources on this subject at pathtoprayer.com. Again, if you've been blessed by this sermon, you can find more sermons by Major Ian Thomas at pathtoprayer.com as well as other resources.